welcome back everyone um i'm um quite excited about our next speaker um johan rogerstedt from sexa um what they do on a daily basis is deal with vast amounts of data and make sense of it all um they do this by smart algorithms and um, and, and machine learning uh, artificial intelligence all those kind of things you hear everybody say but they actually do it um i would like to give the word uh, to johan thank you for that introduction rick uh, i've been along since this morning listening into most of the speakers and i must say it's a very interesting conference that we are having here today and i'm very honored to be a part of it uh, with my presentation on optimized with the tsunami of data adaptivity and individualization in data-driven optimal training uh, my name is Johan Rogerset. I'm based out of Gothenburg, Sweden, uh, and I work at Svexa as a data scientist and software engineer. Svexa is a, as you have said here in the now, but we, I can take a little bit of introduction to Svexa here as well. So Svexa is a sport intelligence company uh, operating out of entities in Silicon Valley, uh, Sweden and Poland. We are working with a lot of different athletes, uh, ranging from um, beginners and recreation athletes all the way to Olympic gold medalists. We're working with sports ranging from cross-country skiing and cycling all the way to baseball and football. So as you understand, we have been working with a lot of different data streams, a lot of different scenarios, and it's definitely in that big data lake where our core business lies. So what we do is usually developing algorithms and microservices and then assembling these into more complex products. Uh, and one of these products is what I will talk about today, i.e. the optimized training. Or in more, what, what I should say here is I will talk about optimized training uh, in a relation to elite sport and the high end of that athlete spectrum that I talked about, the, the more professional athletes. And Essentially, what Svexa is doing and what I will talk about today is to operate in the intersection between data science, physiology and domain knowledge. And by doing this, we can create value for uh, coaches and athletes, uh, such as optimal training, uh, following up on the execution of optimal training with, for example, quantification of training load, quantification of uh, recovery and readiness. And then also use all this data to feedback and be adaptive in what we can suggest in terms of training plans and also recommendations. So for the sake of being a little bit more thorough with the, with the background here, uh, today a lot of what we have heard is discussing the professional athletes and the high end of the spectrum, so to say, with the people that are professional and work at the elite level. And from my background, I think it's worth noting then that besides being then a data scientist with a background in engineering and physics, uh, I am also an elite runner myself, uh, currently preparing for the World Championships this summer in uh, Oregon, Eugene, uh, USA, where I hope to be able to qualify. I'm currently in the list. Let's keep it like that until July, uh, where I will hopefully run the 1500 meters. I have a couple of national titles, two national records, um, been eight times at European Championships. So when it comes to developing algorithms for optimal training, this is something that I've been doing now, both from a theoretical and a practical perspective for many years. Um, and it also highlights very well how we operate at Svexa when we always try to not be just a pure data science company, but also have foundation in both science and then also domain knowledge in sports. Um, so I think that sets sort of a background where I'm coming from, and it sets a little bit of background where Svexa is coming from. And today I will go through step by step, so to say, uh, how we assemble piece by piece by piece to eventually reach the optimal training uh, generation that I was referring to in the in the beginning. So I will give a short introduction to what I actually mean with optimal training from our perspective. Because optimal training could mean a lot of things. But what we essentially mean by optimal training is to be able to tailor to any athlete at any point in time, at any scenario. So to do that, we have to unravel the deep physiological variations between people in order to say that you need this, whereas you need this. 
And this is an example that I, I took. I wrote it down on my phone a couple of years ago, actually, when I was uh, on the training camp with the national team. Uh, and at the same location, there were two world-class runners that were doing the same event, approximately the same times competing for medals in championships. But the fact that they were running the same times, but still were training so differently, you see person A and person B here, uh, really captures the fact that you, there is no secret recipe to fit all. You need to tailor to every individual variation for every person. So person A here is your typical high mileage, low intensity guy with a lot of kilometers every week, a lot of sessions in the mid zones, typically quantified zones in zone one to six. Uh, whereas the other guy is the more speedy one with a little bit less volume, but a lot of high hard sessions, a lot of work in the gym. And the coach would say here that, yeah, I wrote a quote here, but basically person A is the one that responds well to high load, whereas person B needs that stimulus from high intensity sessions. And there is no secret that this is the case for <clears throat> athletes all over the world in all sports. But the problem to identify these sort of things as a data scientist, purely based on data, is the question and the task that we have to solve if we want to uh, be useful and be able to provide recommendations for anyone at any point in time. And that is a good introduction to what I will talk about today. So data-driven sports tech uh, is today very good at collecting data. We have a lot of different uh, gadgets to collect data. We have heard from a few really interesting ones today. I am myself particularly interested in the non-invasive continuous lactate measurements we heard about this morning. That is definitely something that I'm using with the old way <laughs> on the, almost a daily basis. Uh, but to collect data and store data, uh, visualize data, push to your phone, push to your device or whatever you use, that, that we are pretty good at. We have a lot of data and we, we are good at showing data. But what we need to develop further is the individualization and the interaction between data to create that level of smartness that we have seen in so many other parts of tech industry today. Um, the self-driving car of sports tech industry is it's yet to present itself, so to say. We don't have that level of smartness yet. And that is in the direction where we're working at Svexa. And that is like what should be thought of the holy grail for, uh, for, for, for data scientists in the sport tech industry. So if you want to reach, uh, coming back to the title that I had and the sort of the, the goal for this talk, uh, to eventually reach something that is providing recommendations and insights towards optimal training, uh, I will start with this like holistic model uh, and like a, a general description of what we want to do here. So we want to safeguard peak performance in any sport for any athletes at any time. Um, we want to be able to work with a lot of different data. We want to be able to work with objective data that we measure your heart rate, your distance, your uh, lactate, uh, all these kind of things that are either very general for some sports, like we want to be able to quantify readiness, for instance, which is true for any athlete. You want to say, how ready am I to work out today? And then you have the more sport specific metrics uh, that vary obviously in, from case to case. To that comes the subjective data that we have seen is very useful and very important to incorporate into your models, uh, especially now, hope, uh, I, I, I guess also for the long term, um, until you can measure a lot of the like mentally related uh, readiness studies that you can get from uh, like a daily questionnaire, for instance, the, that we have developed. You have data on very different time frames. Sometimes you do a blood sample test uh, every three months, which is something that you want to be able to input to your model. But then you also want, of course, to have the daily updates or even the hourly updates from data streams that you're always measuring, always uh, registering. Uh, I mean, I'm currently wearing my non-invasive glucose monitor because it's a very crucial data stream for my training and my readiness. And that is something I get insights on uh, instantaneously at all points in time. And then using all this data, we want to find the cross correlations between data streams in order to eventually take all this data and create an individual model that a coach would say, this is person A or this is person B from the example before. Um, and then also take it one step further from there and say person A needs 
this sort of recommendations to gain optimal recovery and this person needs other things to do essentially achieve the same thing so just to illustrate a little bit how complex and how uh, detailed we try to be with even the smallest thing in these algorithms um, because it is now to keep the eyes on the optimal training and, uh, and just develop a model to sort of input data and output this is the perfect training plan for you but in order to get there we need to be able to answer more rudimentary and fundamental questions about every person first and readiness is a good example of that and readiness is essentially is the answer to the question how ready am i to work out today given my physical load my mental load and my strategies to cope with load uh, that you accumulate over time and here we have a lot of data coming in you can if we look on the leftmost column with the physical load you have obviously training and or non-exercise physical activities uh, but each of these pieces that you see here uh, first requires in order to be individually uh, relevant for every person and really capture the individual variations between people each piece here first needs some data polishing obviously and we know that data polishing is key you need to be able to have models that are robust to noise sometimes your heart rate monitor stops working sometimes you lend your watch to your uh, to, to your friend for instance who forgot their watch you need to be able to account for a lot of noise uh, in the data that will always be the case but then you also need to develop individual baselines individual safe zones in order to say how hard is this session for me in relation to someone else and of course in some cases you can do lab testing and find out all of these kind of things but ideally you want to be able to do it directly from data because if you can do that not only will you be able to generalize to a broader population who is unable to do testing straight off the lab but you will also be adaptive and that is one of the things that i had in my uh, introduction here that you, do, you only want you always want to be uh, accurate uh, and not only straight after you come out from a lab testing session you want to be accurate on a daily basis so therefore you need to be able to update your metrics and you need to be able to update your profile of a person uh, based on the data that you see <clears throat> so let's start to think about this task that i presented to create an algorithm for optimal training and at Svexa, we all often say that we operate in this intersection between three distinct areas. We always want to have domain knowledge in the sport. Uh, I often come back to running in my examples because that's obviously what's closest to my heart from 15 years plus uh, as a professional athlete. Uh, but no matter what we do, we always want to have that domain knowledge. And otherwise, if we don't have it in-house, we need to gain it from somewhere. So that is one key component in the way that we develop algorithms. Uh, then uh, we all always keep, and we are a lot of scientifically involved people at Svexa who are physiologists or very good at precision medicine. Uh, we have um, a lot of relation to science. Uh, people often do, besides Svexa, they do research, and we are definitely a company operating in a research neighborhood of physiology and if you have these two cornerstones it's not that hard to be a data scientist and just deploy a lot of, of good algorithms and a lot of the modern things that we know is now available if we can first make it individualized and we can do so to say more hands-on algorithms that have as a foundation in physiology and in domain knowledge in sports and then when we add this layer of smartness that we see in all fields of sports tech and tech in general today uh, we can reach what we want and that is an individual and adaptive optimal training schedule so my plan now is to go through this pyramid and so to say is, uh, illustrate how we assemble piece by piece from the bottom to reach the optimal training at the top because it's only if we let this individualization and scientifically valid proofs uh, propagate from the bottom to the top that we know that what we get out at the top is actually useful and actually something that the coach can use as a tool to possibly revise or at least use as a um, fallback uh, when they are designing the training plans for for the athletes so at the very bottom here we have the physiology in algorithms and that is basically what i mean by that is 
basically what metrics are relevant to reach optimal training that will definitely vary from case to case and each such metric coming back to what i talked about before uh, is itself an algorithm that we have to develop so that the algorithm is accurate and adaptive and at the very bottom here i just put down, down a few of the things that we want to be able to input to our model in order to truly unravel the individual profile of a person that we want to be able to uh, present with optimal training of course you want to be able to quantify a training load you want to be able to quantify uh, what their individual zones are all these kind of things directly from data no lab testing needed but then there are more um, deeper physiological variations such as the circadian rhythm or whether you are a sympathetic or parasympathetic response person because these sort of things influence the training and it influences the data that we see and if we can correct the data for these sort of things then obviously we are able to create much more accurate models and we can predict better in the future how a person will respond to certain stimulus so in order to individualize and keep these metrics adaptive uh, we can start to assemble things to the top of this pyramid. So one really like hands-on example that I think people have seen before is the zone, so, like the zones that you usually train in. You say, I do zone five training or I do zone uh, two training today, stuff like that. And that is a good thing to just keep track of what is the purpose of the session I'm gonna do today. So I just took, a, took an example here of the two things that are out there today. You, see, you often see at the bottom left corner something like this if you go to a, this is from a global uh, sport watch manufacturer you, you see that they had used five zones and they say that your zones are fixed for all people which we know is not true obviously because people have very different physiology uh, depending on how on your fitness level on your age on your background in that specific sport just keep i can keep on going for a long time but the fact that zones vary from person to person is very uh, well known and here you see a heart rate curve where we want to sort of uh, intersect how hard this session was for this person and the blue lines illustrate the fixed zones whereas the red so uh, lines are our calculated zones directly from data which is uh, typically what someone will go to a lab and do a lab testing where they will measure heart rate in different speeds and then they will calculate their zones uh, but we have developed models to do this directly from data instead and the effect of using our models in relation to like fixed zones is uh, I, I have an example of that here when you can see how we are our models to the right when you have individual heart rate zones and a little bit deeper load models much better capture the subjective load so if you ask someone how hard did you train yesterday um, and correlate that to the load that we calculate we are much closer to the to the truth if you if you consider what the person said there the trained is the truth which we can assume for this case because this is an elite athlete and elite athletes are typically very good at quantifying how hard the session was on the scale one to ten in this case so this just illustrates how important it is to keep to keep the smallest pieces at the bottom of this pyramid individual because imagine if you keep if you do the the left zones here uh, in the left figure here and use the non-individualized zones well then in every time you want to quantify how hard a session was for a person you will be further away from the truth than you are to the right and then of course we can make this r2 score even better if we deploy deeper models uh, this is just a quite simple example that i, that I did for, for this purpose just to illustrate the effect of being individual and this individualization then is a very important thing when we start to again assemble more complex products because errors will sort of accumulate over time and accumulate between the in this assembly process if you all have big errors in each step so one of the things that we do at this point is our athlete passport which is a an algorithm that or more of a product uh, consisting of a lot of algorithms that we have developed that finds the most prominent and significant relations that drive performance and recovery. And that's basically the, science, the data science equivalent of a coach saying, this person is this uh, responds to this sort of stimulus, or this person responds to this sort of uh, recovery plans or strategies. Um, and for us, 
it's very important to do all of this and assemble uh, fundamental physiologically relevant algorithms to an athlete passport before we can present to someone uh, an optimal training schedule. Because again, people are different and people vary in how they respond to training. So assemble algorithms like this. I have created here like a mock-up profile of what that could look like. And then here you see like a one pager of a person with a lot of different metrics on. But the key takeaway message when you see this sort of mock-up profile is that these metrics will be different for another person. In some cases, it might be that the values differ. You see in the middle of the screen, you see some safe, uh, safe range for heart rate variability and heart rate, resting heart rate. Uh, these might be in another athlete passport as well, but with different numbers. And in some cases, we might, instead of highlighting uh, the relation between low tolerance and injury, we might be highlighting other factors that are more prominent and more driving for that particular person. And this sort of profiling and how we can put together algorithms and data streams and be flexible in what data streams we have available. Because obviously some people will measure a lot of things. You have your uh, tech junkies out there who got every gadget possible and they wear it all and they store it all and they just have what me, I as a data scientist uh, find is the perfect world. They, they basically cover everything. But then some people don't do that and some people don't really like to, to measure things. But we have to be able to be optimal with whatever we have available. So besides being individual and adaptive in our algorithms, we're also very flexible in our assembly of algorithms to what data we have available. Again, we don't want to squeeze people into a box where they have to have all of these, 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 and these algorithms. We want to say, what do you have? And then we say, we can do this with what you have. So this profile then, together with our fundamental algorithms, moves us to the top of the pyramid, which is uh, the optimal training. And at Svekta, we have this product when we deliver, so to say, recommendations for optimal training. Uh, we call it ELIDA. Uh, and that is for this conference today. We should see it as a tool and a recommendation engine for experienced trainer. Because typically, if we talk about elite athletes, they have their coach who is giving them a training plan and then they execute the training plan and the coach is trying to keep up with how the athlete is performing, make adjustments on the go. So what we want to deliver here is sort of given a skeleton of a training plan that the coach is providing, how can we make small perturbations to that training plan and sort of say this perturbation is the most likely training uh, plan to give the best performance on the day of the race. So from a mathematical perspective and from a data scientist perspective, as, 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 I, as I work, yes, uh, we want to optimize performance towards some point in the future. And that involves then monitoring and analysis of the data that we collect, we process the data, we model the, the person, and then we simulate the person. So we simulate how the person will respond to training. Uh, and then this is done uh, from the daily schedule and we update the daily schedule, at least with, well, it depends again. If, if we have a recreation athlete, we want to update the schedule ourselves because then there is no experienced, high, high experienced trainer in there. The high experienced trainer is basically our system. But then when we work with elite athletes, then obviously the coach will still have the highest experience with the working with the athletes. Uh, so we work with the, the feedback loop and recommendations to the coach that can make small adjustments. And out of all this pops an optimal training schedule. So I will show a three-stage um, modeling and simulation procedure uh, that we have um, that were developed. So first you want to be able to answer the question, how has a person historically responded to, to training? And what, what is their uh, individual response to training and to all the data that you have available? That is your readiness over time, your uh, performances, and then again, your training load, uh, everything taken, the individual variations into account. And you want to build that model of historic response to the combination of training and readiness. 
And then you build this model that ideally explains very well how a person uh, responds to training. Because if you have a good model, you can take a training plan. And now this might just look like a big swarm of, of points to you, but I'm sort of trying to explain what it is. It is the model that I just described, the model explaining how a person responds to a certain training plan and then taking that model and simulating a lot of different training plans. I think this is like a thousand or 3000 training plans and then I'll predict the output. And if we do that, we can of course pick the best one and illustrate it in a more intuitive way, maybe depending on your <laughs> or how you like this figure. But each line here is a predicted performance over time. And at the very bottom to the right, you have a red uh, circle saying this plan, which is the line that ends at the lowest value because this is times. So we want to have a low time to be a good performance, uh, results in the best expected performance. Um, and then that means that we have developed a model, we have developed uh, a response pattern to training. Uh, and then found what we think is the best training load for an athlete. And then we can go back to the coach and say, hey, we think this, this alterations in terms of training load can make the most sense because your athlete has historically tolerated this amount of load in these zones, um, given this situation they are in now. And as I understand, there are a lot of different uh, things to take in, into consideration when you want to make such prediction about the future. But that is why we let the individualization and let the adaptivity propagate from the very bottom, from the very first algorithms that I talked about previously to the top. Uh, because then we think that what we actually get at this stage is far more likely to be useful for someone than if we just start here and hope that AI and machine learning can solve all the noise and all the errors that are very likely to be introduced um, if we don't do the polishing first. <clears throat> and then like I, I will mention this as well, which is our newest addition to <laughs> optim optimized training, which I think is really cool. Uh, and might not be as elite orientated as um, recreational beginner or at least at least for anyone without a coach, I can say. Uh, and that is taking this training load that I showed in the previous figure, the optimal training load, and actually populate it with an actual description of what you're supposed to do. Because as we know, it's not so useful for, for someone to be told you're supposed to do 110 units today. Uh, and, and even if you just, I mean, obviously we output something which is more detailed than that. You have maybe output how many units per zone you're supposed to do. But even at that point, it's hard to know, well, how should I do that? So what you typically want to do is add the layer of actually having historic sessions from a specific coach in your library of, um, uh, <clears throat> in, your, in your library of uh, historic sessions, and then input this sort of much more detailed information to your model. And then the output will not just be numbers that you should perturbate your session with, but it would also be actual details, such as you're supposed to do threshold session four by five minutes of two minutes recovery. And this additional layer of smartness makes us, been, we can actually output finished training plans instead of just outputting, again, small, small perturbations. And this also lets us uh, do, from a mathematical perspective, we can op we can optimize in a in a less constrained space, so to say. We have we have much more freedom when we can just look at historic data. So what we actually do in in this um, we call it GERT, this uh, <laughs> um, uh, algorithm, or well, it's more than an algorithm in this framework. Uh, we mimic the style of a coach. So we take historically how a coach has been training and we use a sophisticated modern AI to reproduce the train of thought for a coach. And as you can see to the in the top figure there, uh, compared to a benchmark K nearest neighbor uh, approach, our GERT model is much better than to uh, estimate and predict the, um, what load you should have given uh, the, the inputs. 
And then going, going forward here, we don't only output very accurately how much load an elite coach would suggest given the current state. We also say um, at what session should you do which load. So like at, at what time of the week you should do what kind of session. That also is represented in the bottom right here with uh, we can actually also hit the correct time in each zone because obviously load is calculated from all the zones but if we can actually get the correct amount of time in each zone we're even closer to reproduce the training plans that elite coaches are uh, doing. And the sweet thing here then is that this framework lets us scale any training philosophy basically up and down to any number of sessions. So basically someone who is a beginner or a recreation athlete doing a couple of sessions a week can train like their elite coach, but with a scaled down version within the same philosophy of training. Uh, and that is pretty neat, if you ask me, uh, that you can train like your uh, favorite runner or your favorite swimmer, uh, but in your own or at your own level. So to draw some conclusions here, uh, data is becoming easier and easier to collect and store and use, but we need to be individual and adaptive to make models that actually increase the, the usage and um, and, and become and lets us create recommendations and insights that an elite coach can use in order to peak perform uh, their athletes uh, at any point in time. Um, and our principles has always been to work at, on the foundation of physiology and data science together. And it's only by assembling pieces that are each accurate and that are each uh, logically relevant that we can create useful models uh, that are complex and, and uh, so to say a, a sum of many small individual components. And then like, uh, and then to sum up our uh, approach here to get to the individual optimal training plan is really to use these kind of models to simulate the future and then come back to a coach with recommendations and insights in order for that coach to by themselves then of course uh, say if they want to use these recommendations or not. But it's a good fallback system and it's hopefully something that can create great value for elite athletes and then hopefully in the future uh, any beginner and recreation athlete who want to optimize their performance. Thank you. That was it for, for me. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thank you uh, very much, uh, Johan. Um, always nice um, to, to hear you tell the, tell the Swexa story again. Uh, always impressed by what you guys do. Um, I, I did get a question. Um, yeah. How much data can be collected automatically from wearables and similar, and how much is needed to enter it manually into the app? Yeah, that's a good question. And uh, uh, I could, of course, give the data science answer and say the more data, the better, which is always going to be the case. Uh, but uh, the good thing to, nowadays is that there are so many different devices that you can track and get data from. So what you, you can, to answer the question of how much uh, data that can be collected is really a question of how, what gadgets do you have? And I, what we see typically is that the strong, uh, the, the strong insights and the really important values uh, that, we, um, that we find is the, when we share uh, data from different sources and combine it. So we, we don't just consider the training data and we don't just consider sleep data or glucose data, but it's the combination of data that really makes it useful. Um, so that sort of answers that question. Uh, and then typically how we operate is uh, less of our app and more of white labeled versions in other clients apps. So it depends on what that client is um, is collecting. But we are usually very flexible in what data we can work with. And I think I mentioned that, that uh, we don't want to be a, a company who can just work with a certain predefined set of data. We want to be able to be optimal with what we get. Yeah. Um, and also, if I understand it correctly, um, um, when you... Um, have uh, certain algorithms um, developed that even if 
on a particular individual athlete, uh, a little piece of data is missing, it's still, um, you can still use it. It's not that um, every time the data set has to be 100% correct to get an answer. No, exactly. That is definitely a good way to put it. Yeah. Um, second question, uh, how is a load defined? Just accumulated time in the different heart rate zones or um, are you also taking other factors into account? For example, active um, uh, versus rest ratio. Yeah, that, that is a great question. And it's definitely a, a very difficult thing to do really accurate. It's easy to calculate the load approximately correct and do what you basically said first there. Just take time in each zone and then have some coefficient and then just accumulate. Um, but it's very sport specific. Coming back to that, that you need domain knowledge about a specific case. Uh, take like I do running, for instance. Like heart rate is not a very good metric for high speed running because the heart rate is a too slow uh, varying metric. If I run a 120 meter all out sprint, my heart rate will not capture the fact that that's really hard for my body. So you need to be able to know from the different situations what is the correct metrics to use in every scenario. Um, so yeah, I think that that, that is the best message, uh, best answer to that question. It's very dependent on the situation. Yeah, makes sense. Um, and I've got a question, um, which is uh, somebody already trying the free app. I did install the free app and all I can do is tap in info to some categories. Um, Maybe if this is a really short answer, Johan, uh, you, you can answer it straight away. Otherwise, I'll, I'll, I'll make sure you get in touch. Yeah, after. yeah. So uh, I, I think I mentioned that just just a, a second ago. That uh, a lot of the things I'm talking about here is typically not in our app because uh, uh, what we do typically is work with another partner uh, as a white labeled version that they implement on their end. So to, like our app does not support these functions because we are not the, we're more of a backend company. But I'm, I'm, I'm happy to get in touch with this person and we can discuss that more. Uh, yeah. Okay. I'll, um, I'll make sure you, uh, you two get in touch uh, afterwards. Uh, Perfect. I'll send you to uh, an, an email uh, so you can, uh, can get in touch. Yeah. Great. Oh, and that was uh, uh, looking at the questions. That was uh, basically it. Um, Thank you. Johan, uh, th yeah, thanks again. Uh, thanks a lot for, uh, for being with us. And um, yeah, as I already mentioned, I always like uh, how you tell uh, the, the, the Svexa story. And um, um, I hope we, uh, we talk soon again. Yeah, thank you very much for a great conference. I will stick around and listen to the upcoming speakers. <laughs> thanks, Johan. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, our next uh, speaker coming up is um, our own uh, Movella um, uh, colleague, Maria. And uh, Maria will talk about using IMU sensors and uh, standardized reporting to make uh, rehab um, and return to play protocols more um, objective instead of um, subjective based on um, yeah, people's personal opinions or drive to get back on the pitch or um, a pressure from outside. And that objectivity could, um, could be an interesting uh, one in, uh, in many sports. And looking at um, the ACL rehab and return to play protocol, especially for football, an interesting one, but uh, I guess for any, any high-speed uh, sport.